morning and welcome to the December 12, 2017 regular meeting of the Troy Planning Commission. Copies of the agenda for tonight's meeting are available at the entrance to the room. Additionally, the agendas and minutes of prior meetings are available on the city's website. The meeting will be conducted in accordance with the agenda as presented or amended by the Planning Commission. The roles and responsibilities of the Planning Commission are outlined on the reverse side of tonight's agenda. State law establishes Planning Commissions. The Commission is comprised of nine members, all of whom have volunteered to serve. Members are appointed by the Mayor and confirmed by City Council. The other individuals seated at the table this evening are representatives of the City's Planning Department, the City Attorney's Office, and the City's Planning Consultant, Carlisle Wartman & Associates. If you wish to address the Planning Commission, Please come forward when recognized and provide your name and address on the sign-on sheet. Please begin your remarks by stating your name for the benefit of the commissioners. All remarks are to be addressed to the Planning Commission, not to anyone else in the room. At this time, I ask that all cell phones, tablets, PDAs, or any other devices that might disrupt this meeting, please either be placed in silent mode or be turned off. The roll call, Ms. Sarnicki, please. Mr. Abihudian? Here. Ms. Cruz? Here. Mr. Edmonds? Here. Mr. Faison? Mr. Hudson? Mr. Krent? Here. Ms. Koopa? Here. Mr. Zanzika? Here. Mr. Tagle? Here. Ms. Howe? Here. Quorum present. Item number two on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda, please? Ms. Koopa and uh, second, Mr. Sanzika. Roll call Ms. Sarnicki, please. Ms. Cruz? Here. Yes. Ms. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. <coughs> Mr. Print? Yes. Ms. Koopa? Yes. Mr. Zanzika? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Apahidia? Yes. Item number three on the agenda is approval of the minutes uh, for the November 28, 2017 meeting. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes, please? Mr. Mr. Edmonds? Is published. And uh, second? Ms. Koopa? Roll call, Ms. Harnicki, please. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Krent? Yes. Ms. Koopa? Yes. Mr. Zanzika? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Abstain. Mr. Abhidian? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Item number four on the agenda, public comment for items not on the agenda. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak to an item that is not on the agenda tonight? Seeing none, we'll move to item number five on the agenda, preliminary site plan review. File number SCJPLN 2017-0028, proposed Oak Forest number four site condominium, 25 units slash lots south of Square Lake, west of John R, east side of Willow Grove, section 11, currently zoned R1C, one family residential district. Mr. Edmonds. Mr. Chairman. I reside in Gulf Trail subdivision within a half mile of the proposed Oak Forest Forward development. I oppose the original 2005 Oak Forest South development. The 2005 Oak Forest South proposal included a cul-de-sac at the east end and exited at the corner of Trevino Drive at Willow Grove. The City Council at that time passed a resolution to have a diagonal barrier at the corner of Willow Grove and Trevino. The 2005 Oak Forest South application has now expired, and a revised Oak Forest 4 application is before us tonight. I have served nine years on the Planning Commission, being appointed in December of 2008. As a member of my Master Citizen Planner training, as part of my Master Citizen Planner training, I have come to learn the importance of interconnectivity of neighborhoods. In conclusion, I do believe I can independently and objectively arrive at a decision on the Oak Forest 4 application before us tonight. Upon the advice and counsel of the City Attorney, I therefore ask the Planning Commission to decide as to whether I should be recused from voting on this matter before us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edmonds. Um, I think I'm going to bring it back to the Planning Commissioners tonight. We will just take a vote on um, allowing Mr. Edmonds to attend the meeting and not recuse himself if everybody, can we do that? Yes. Would, no, Mr. Chairman, would you mind if I, if I put um, our Assistant City Attorney on the spot? Sure. Just to talk, uh, very, very briefly indicate um, um, what would qualify as a conflict of interest. Sure. Really, it's if you have some sort of pecuniary interest in 
in the development or in the um, surrounding area. Pecuniary meaning money. money. Yes, monetary, yes. And, and that is not the case in I did not in hear that case. in Mr. Okay. Evans' letter. Right. But Mr. Sanzica? I have no objection. Uh, I wouldn't suggest that Mr. Evan recluse himself. I, I, he's a fair and objective a man, and I, I think he would do a good job on uh, whatever decision he does make. Um, sh do we need to take a vote? Should we take a vote on this just to have a clear uh, vote whether regarding the recusal or not? Do you, do you agree, Ms. Mr. Frank? Yes, Mr. Edmonds and Ms. Bloom had spoken earlier this week, and that was what Mr. Ms. Bloom had suggested we do in this case. Okay, then um, let's, let's take a vote on um, allowing Mr. Edmonds to stay for the meeting this evening. Um, Ms. Harnicky, we'll do that. Either a yes, with a vote with a yes. Yes or no. Roll call, please. Ms. Mr. Krent? Yes. Ms. Kupa? Yes. Mr. Sanzica? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Apahedian? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. And Mr. Edmonds? Abstain. So the vote passes, Mr. Edmonds can participate in the meeting without recusing himself tonight. Thank you. Then we'll move on with item number five, uh, Mr. Carlisle, or Mr. Savant. Okay, Mr. Carlisle. Good evening, Planning Commission and the public. I'd like to start off my uh, very brief presentation with an apology both to the public as well as the Planning Commission. Um, it, it came to my attention there were a few typos or, or errors in my report, including referring to Willow Grove as Willowbrook a few times in referring to golf estates or golf trail as golf estates when it's actually the golf trail subdivision. So I, that's been corrected in your packet and I want to let the public know I did recognize that, acknowledge it, um, and so hopefully that's corrected moving forward. Um, just to explain the application tonight, uh, we did receive an application for a 25 unit detached single family site condominium project. The site is bisected by the, by the Oakland County drain. Um, the project is directly south of the recently approved Oak Forest 3 project, and it also directly connects to that project. If the Planning Commission can see in the graphic above your head, this was the recently approved Oak Forest 3 subdivision that was approved last meeting. Ashwood is going to continue south and then connect to the new, now this is proposed Oakwood 4 subdivision, and then continue. Um, Oak Forest 4 and continue and meet up with Willow Grove at this location. Again, it directly connects with Willow Grove across from the uh, Trevino Drive as part of the Gulf Trails uh, subdivision. We do note that Ashwood would be extended and would serve this development as well as the Oak, uh, Oak Forest 3 development. And again, a second point of access to this proposed development would be located uh, off Willow Grove, which does connect at Trevino at that location. We do note that Willow Grove is a public gravel road. The applicant has identified a tree survey and has identified uh, 219 regulated trees on site. Of those 219 regulated trees, the applicant proposes to remove 185 of those and preserve 34. As a result of removing those 185 trees, the applicant is required to mitigate with 38 additional trees. They have done so on their site and scattered within the 25 units in the development. We do note that all the lots do meet the R1C minimum zoning requirements and all are regular in shape and would provide for a building envelope that does meet the ordinance requirements. The applicant has provided a landscape plan. The landscape plan does comply with all the requirements of a site condominium. We do note that along the eastern property line, there is an identified area as an open space common area. Again, similar to other developments that we've asked be uh, of this before, we do ask that the applicant provide um, some guarantee that that area will be, will be maintained by the Homeowners Association if this project is approved. In addition, the applicant has submitted floor plans and elevations. The elevations f uh, show four different housing types, including one ranch style option. Obviously, the biggest point of discussion and concern for the, for the Planning Commission tonight and from the uh, adjacent properties is the issue of connectivity, specifically connectivity at Trevino Drive. As noted, um, the development does directly connect to Willow Grove where it meets Trevino Drive, and we have received numerous comments from the adjacent properties uh, in regards to their concern with cut through traffic, increased traffic, safety, um, and home value, or home, uh, uh, home values. 
Um, we have had a discussion uh, numerous times with the Planning Commission in regards to connectivity, and we do note that it is typically a longstanding policy of the city to provide neighborhood connectivity. However, um, in light of the concerns of the residents, we did seek an expert opinion on this matter, um, and we did retain a memo from the traffic consultant OHM, who is the traffic consultant to the city in regards to their opinion with the proposed connection. That memo was provided to the Planning Commission, and there is a copy for the public tonight to review that memo in totality. Um, in that memo, uh, OHM does highlight the benefits of neighborhood connectivity. These benefits include providing multiple points of access for public safety, providing uh, cohesion in creation of neighborhoods, allowing for the safe and efficient administration of public services. These public services include garbage collection, school buses, mail delivery, and snow plowing. The reason for the efficiency of this is this allows services to not have to backtrack and allow them to continue in a, uh, into a more efficient route through, throughout and within the neighborhoods. It also reduces the need for uh, additional traffic uh, moving on to major roads. In addition, they do note a public benefit is that they, uh, that connect interconnectivity provides better traffic circulation. This one allows residents to travel within neighborhoods, um, from neighborhood to neighborhood, and secondly, provides for multiple options for residents um, getting in and out of their neighborhoods. Uh, providing traffic circulation does provide for safer driving options because it reduces traffic volumes on any one street and also does uh, prevent uh, overcrowding on the major mile roads. In addition, the OHM has addressed common concerns that are raised with the issue of interconnectivity. These uh, concerns include speeding, cut through traffic, and increased crime. OHM uh, does acknowledge that those are some legitimate concerns, however, they do offer options to consider as to why these may not be warranted in every case uh, in, uh, in regards to connectivity. In addition, OHM specifically looked at this issue of, of connection um, in relation to this proposed development. And they note that at the peak AM, the anticipated traffic volume with these 25 houses would generate approximately 23 trips. These are trips within the neighborhood, both going through and to uh, uh, Trevino, as well as going north on Ashwood. They do note that of those 23 trips, they estimate that six or seven of them would actually go through the Gulf Trails uh, subdivision. The remaining would go alternative locations, including out Ashwood, et cetera. The numbers were similar for the peak PM traffic for this amount. So in conclusion, um, based on our review of the plan, which does comply with the, all the R1C zoning requirements, as well as the review and recommendation from OHM, which does note um, rationale and recommendations for neighborhood connectivity, we are recommending preliminary site plan of approval, provided the applicant provide um, a, a means and maintenance for, for in regards to the open space once the site is developed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlisle. Yes, Mr. Savina. I want to reiterate a couple of things that Mr. Carlisle said. Uh, one, we received a number of emails from residents related to this application. And every one of those emails was provided to the Planning Commission, either in the, in the agenda packet or provided in front, before them this evening. So they, they do get these, uh, these emails. And I want to reiterate, anyone who did not receive a hard copy of the uh, traffic study, it's outside the door on the right-hand side. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Savina. Any questions for Mr. Carlisle? Ms. Coos, or I, I do have a question before we get started, and, and one of the things that I would like um, the city attorney's office to do is, is talk about um, what it means to have a proposed um, site approval in front of us when um, it is permitted by right. Sure, so a, a site, this is a site plan review. Um, which means there's no special use, there's no conditional zoning, and under our ordinance and under the state law, as Mr. Carla pointed out, as long as the site plan um, complies with our ordin zoning ordinance, um, this you you as you know, having reviewed these, there's very little discretion that you have, as long as everything is everything that's been proposed by the de developer um, complies with our ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Edmonds. Yes, uh, this is a question for uh, Mr. Carlisle. The number of traffic trips going through uh, into Torino and uh, into Gulf Trail Streets, 
only come from the Oak Forest 4 subdivision. How many additional trips might possibly be originating from Oak Forest number 3, which we recently approved? Um, Mr. Edmonds, the, the OHM did not give us that information. Um, there are 25 units being proposed as part of Oak Forest 4, which again is just yellow, what we're looking at tonight. There were 12 units approved as part of Oak Forest 3. Assuming the same number or percentage, um, it would probably be an additional three or four cars. At some point, though, the farther north you get, the less likely they are going to be going around this route. So again, but based on the estimate, I would assume if you add those two in totality, you're looking at probably 10 or so cars during the peak periods of traffic. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Carlisle? If not, the applicant, I see the, uh, not, not, not at this point, sir. Thank you. The applicant is here and uh, you may come forward, please. Good evening. John Thompson with Professional Engineering representing Wright Square, uh, Waddle Square, Inc. Sorry. Uh, good evening, board. My name is Steve Orr, and uh, I represent Waddle Square also. I'm also a representative of the builder who is currently building the product in, in phase two of Oak Forest and also built out phase one of Oak Forest. So I'm all inclusive of, of all those activities. Um, we think staff did a great job with respect to their um, review. We think OHM did a good job with respect to the traffic study. Um, I would uh, add one other piece of information, and that's uh, when Oak Forest South uh, was approved, um, that subdivision was approved, connected to Willow Grove and stubbed to the north, which would have created the future conductivity then, um, though that sub didn't come through. We're simply doing the same thing. Um, and once again, this is a by right subdivision. Uh, we're not asking for any additional uh, restrictions, compliances, or special uses. Thank you. Did, did you want to did comment anything? No, sir. No. Okay. Any, any questions for the applicant? Mr. Edmonds. I, I asked this question of most uh, developments, residential developments that come before us. What are the uh, size of the unit of the, of the, and the floor plans, and what are the price points? Our goal is to uh, retain the site plan, or the, uh, the uh, building plans that we're currently building in phase two, and offer uh, actually a more varied product. We're gonna offer a ranch, which we provided you plans to look at. I think it's about 2,500 square foot uh, with uh, all brick, uh, sides, uh, beautiful front elevations, uh, di three different elevations to, to choose from uh, for each uh, building type. So what we're trying to create is uh, a little uh, street, uh, you know, a, a pretty streetscape with, with a varied product uh, that ranges from 2,500 square foot ranch to about a 3,700 square foot colonial. And my question about the price point? Uh, I believe our price point right now, uh, we have a colonial that starts at uh, four, about 495000 and uh, the ranch would be considerably less than that, but we really haven't come up with a sales price for that yet. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Cooper. Ben, can you go to page 37? It has the elevations. I was trying to figure out which of those is the ranch. That, that would be the ranch, the one we're looking at right now. So A, on page 37, it's, there's a page that has all four of them side by side. Yeah. 
that There's one? There's no ranches there. There's no ranches here. So the ranch is separate. It's not one of the four. No. The four we, yes, ma'am. We've only we only developed one elevation so far. Mr. Tegel. One of your floor plans indicates that the garage entrances are on the side of the house, but I see no elevations that reflect that. Do you plan to build any of your homes with the garage entrances on the side of your house? Uh, the Typically, the corner lots will accommodate a side entry garage, and the, the other lots that are 76 and a half feet wide uh, will accommodate the front entry garages. We do have uh, several models that uh, we, we are considering offering that would have a side entry garage, but the floor plans are, are, are slightly awkward and, and not as popular. So uh, we, we let's uh, we, we've the commission has looked at this uh, in depth as far as what makes an attractive streetscape and putting the garages up front and pushed in front of the entry and the rest of the massing of the houses is not an element that we find that's really a positive. Uh, we're putting the automobile ahead of any pedestrian activities on the street by doing that. So I was curious, with your, uh, you know, with your floor plan, it does show the side elevations, if you're really going to build anything that has that or if it was somehow put in the package, but really in this development we're not going to see any of that. Uh, that's a good question. In, 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 phase, in phase two of Oak Forest, which you enter south off of uh, Square Lake, just uh, <clears throat> west of John R., we have a pretty good mix of side entry and front entry garages. So it sets up a pretty nice streetscape. Um, it's a little bit harder to do. And like I said, the, the side entry garages create a, a slightly awkward floor plan. But some, some people like them, so we've been able to market them. That's where your that's where your design designer can come up with some creative solutions to yeah, awkward it, and eliminate awkward. It's situations. really it's really really difficult, honestly. But we we've done our best, and and I think if you if you take a trip down the street, you'll see we've got a we've got a really really nice streetscape with the open yeah. space and, and the very product. Well, uh, you know, again, I, I understand you, this is your submittal for this evening, and uh, it is what it is. But in the future, I would really, if you do other developments in this city and you come back in front of us, I would like to see consideration for more of, of the pedestrian elements forefronting the automobile, uh, you know, as far as pushing the garage up front or putting the entrance on the side of the garage. Okay. Mr. Edmonds. Uh, of the Oak Forest uh, 1 and 2, how many ranches did you actually build in those two subdivisions? <laughs> Oak Forest One, I believe, has six. Okay. And two. Uh, oh, 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 to this point, Oak Forest Two has zero. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Cruz. Did you say that your colonial floor plan uh, was up to thirty-seven hundred square feet? Yes. 3750 actually. 3750 could you eliminate some of that awkwardness that's created by a side entry garage by shrinking the overall house size so that you had more space to work with in a design situation like 3700 square feet that's a that's a big house. I don't disagree but um, it, it, the, the actual floor plan is about 3,400, and we figured out a way to add a loft that generates the square footage. Um, so the basic floor plan of the largest colonial, colonial we offer is about 3,450, and then you can add a loft over the great room, which creates that extra 300 square feet. And we offer a colonial that comes in a 3,000 square foot size with a three car front entry garage and then it can, can be converted into a 3,200 square foot home with a formal dining room which which is becoming passe in today's world but some people still have that big dining room table and that big family that they want to accommodate so they're willing to uh, sacrifice the three car garage for the dining room so we offer that flexibility and then um, of course, we're, we're trying to offer a ranch, but they're, they're expensive per square foot to build, so they're, they're losing a lot in popularity. Uh, Ranches? On, yeah. On, on I want a ranch so ev badly. Ev everybody wants uh, a ranch. You have no idea how badly I I wish I could ranch. figure out a way to 
to build them efficiently, but they're, they're very, very expensive to build, and typically they're empty nesters, they're expensive to heat, and it's hard, for, people don't understand why. The Do you know how many baby boomers there are in this town Absolutely. that are empty nesters? Absolutely, and we, we've, we did our best in phase one to, to market a ranch, but it, 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 the square foot price is so much more than the colonial, it's hard for people to grasp, so it's hard for them to get over. We, we actually offered two different ranches in phase one, and we, we found them very difficult to sell. Could you help me understand how it is that everyone that I know, whose home I've been in with a side entry garage, which is probably 90%, 85% of my subdivision, how we all manage to walk into a laundry room, mud room that walks into a kitchen, and yet there feels nothing awkward about that traffic pattern. I, I'm not understanding I, I, the question. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm in agreement w with what Mr. Tagle said. I mean, the idea of the massing of a house being behind the garage is, um, especially in homes of, of this size, I, it's not, it's just, it's not visually appealing. It seems like um, with the creativity that's available in the market today with uh, design firms and architects, there's got to be a way in which you can create a pretty streetscape and give people side entry garages that go into mud rooms that, that doesn't upset the traffic pattern or the flow in a floor plan and feel awkward, well, right? Uh, again, with, with the width of the lot that we have to work with. But you could shrink and, the house, and, the, and then you would have a lot more lot. We only have 55 feet of width of a building to work with, which is, which is, which is minimal anyway. So um, it's very, it, we actually offer two different products in Oak Forest, two right now that are side entry garages. And the streetscape is very nice. <coughs> But what, what I mean by awkward is it, it, in order to accommodate uh, that side entry garage, you need 22 feet for the apron and you need two foot of green space, which is required by the city of Troy, between the edge of the driveway and the garage door. So you, you end up with 24 feet from the lot line to the garage door, then a 24 foot garage, which is typical to fit a modern car, so you're up to 48 feet, then you've got uh, a 10-foot side yard setback to deal with, so th there's not much left on the other side of, of the garage. It's, it, it, it may seem like it's, it's possible, and we worked really, really hard to try to develop a product that, that people like, and what happens is you sacrifice the, uh, the dining room. There's no way you can get a formal dining room in that floor plan, which is, a, which is historically a, a very popular home. People like to have a formal dining room. The ones that don't uh, are the ones that'll buy the side entry product because they get a great room and a den and a, a, a big nook. So it's, 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 a, it's an informal dining space that can accommodate a big table, but it, it's, it's not formal at all. And there's, there's, it, it's, it's impossible with a 3,000 square foot home to include a dining room on the first floor and still leave enough living space for a family. So it, it, it's, it, that, that's pretty much the way it lays out. So I'm not sure I'm, I'm understanding your question or answering it. No, uh, let, let me just explain. I, I'm not an architect, I'm not an engineer, and I'm not, you know, in the, the construction or, or residential housing building market or, or industry in any way. Um, it just, everything that I hear sounds like you only have a lot that is X big, and you're trying to squeeze the maximum house onto that lot that you possibly can um, in order to maximize size and at, at the expense of some other things, some other design considerations that we as a planning commission have decided that we would very much like to see in this town. I mean, for us to continue down a path where we just approve subdivisions that are more of the same only results in us maintaining a status quo. It doesn't help us move this city forward and offer the types of housing that we know the city needs. 
Well, so. we're, we're, unfortunately, we're restricted a little bit by the market. We can offer a smaller product with different things, but most of the modern buyer is looking for square foot for the money. So the first thing they ask every builder is, how big is the house and how much does it cost? And then you do some simple math, and they say, well, this builder's X amount per square foot, and this builder's you know, Z amount per square foot. So there, there is flexibility in design. The problem is, um, you know, it, typically those designs are, are much, just like a ranch is much more costly than a colonial. And, and all brick is much more costly than siding. And a hip roof is more expensive than a gable. So as you, as you add these design features that are very desirable, the problem is the cost goes up. So if you were to offer a product like that, um, with all the things you, you could probably do it, but it would probably cost the, buy, the, the end user 30, 40% more. And we would be happy to accommodate them if they wanted to do that, but it's just not possible at the price point that we're selling at. Well, call me skeptical. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Edmonds. I'm sure you're aware of all the opposition in the neighboring Gulf Trail subdivision, of which I'm a resident. Have you made any efforts to speak to those people about this development? Because we really do encourage developers to speak to residents. Can you tell me, have you had a neighborhood meeting or anything about this subdivision to the people of Gulf Trail? Oh, what we have to be a yes or no. We did not have a meeting Thank you. with Golf Trail. Yeah. Back to the uh, side entrance garages. It appears on A, drawing A5, there is a side entrance garage. Is that? Um, I'm not familiar with the way the drawings are, are marked, but. The, the drawing itself in the lower. I, lower, yeah, I just don't know which one is your referring to. In the lower right-hand corner. Page 48. There you go. Yes. Is that a side entrance garage? It is. Okay. So you do offer that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Yes, Mr. Tegel. I just want to make sure. I can't tell whoever. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure the question that was just asked you about you offering this side entrance garage, it's a, is that going to be offered in this subdivision? It, it, th that uh, particular plan will fit on three or four of the lots, yes. Okay, so there are lots in here that you don't have a yes, restriction. Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And the price point isn't going to be affected by the side entrance versus the front entrance. The, we, we charge a little bit more. There's extra driveway and concrete and, and other factors, but it's, it's, an, it's an option. It would be like adding air conditioning to your car. Well, they don't do that anymore, but I try to, for discussion purposes, it's an option. Thank you. Mr. Sanzica. I guess I have to ask the question. Did, um, did you ever consider at all any um, rear yard bioswales rather than the, uh, the pipe as proposed? I'm sorry? The bioswales in lieu of pipe for the rear drainage? We did not. Actually, we are. Oh, we are. <laughs> I'm sorry. What? Um, so we're going to discuss that with engineering as we proceed. Um, there are several lots that back up to the J.C. Park. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Um, so in lieu of rear yard, um, depending upon engineering approval, uh, we'll let those rear lots discharge into the park, uh, potentially doing a diversion swale um, first, and then anything that would overflow would go into the park itself. So uh, that'll be subject to engineering approval. What is the park that you refer to? JC. Oh, JC Park? You're going to drain into JC Park? Sorry? You, you're allowed to drain into JC Park? We're going to discuss that with engineering. We, th that would have to be dis mis I'm sorry, Mr. Yes, Chair. Mr. Yes. Hey, Mr. Savadon. As, as the petitioner indicated, it would have to be dis that would have to be a discussion that they would have with engineering. Right. So that would be to the south, the uh, south property line, the JC Park. Correct. 
Correct. So based on the flow, based on the flow, uh, I mean, we can put rear yard storm sewer in. We can take all the trees out. We can direct everything back to the federally. Um, we're looking for innovative solutions. Um, so diversionary ditches and uh, bioswales are one of the things that we're considering for the rear yard. Great. Thank you. I, I, would I would take exception to that because how can you drain rear yards from Oak Forest 4 that abut the federally drain into Oak? Doesn't the, uh, oh, I see, it's after the, so it's after the drain or is it, where, where, where is the federally drain? Uh, in, in relationship to J.C. Park. J.C. Park is quite a ways away. I don't know how you could, are you going to run soil pipes across the creek? How would you do that? Mr. Savanat, can we pull up an aerial just showing, there we go, okay. Immediately to the south. So J.C. Park is immediately to the south of yeah. Oak Forest 4. This is where my red dot is. Mr. Edmonds, where my red dot is, that's, the, that's J.C. Park. But yeah. isn't there and a the drain, drain, the drain, the drain that separates J.C. Park and, and... This is the drain runs in this, approximately this location. But the drain runs into J... This is all part of J.C. Park. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, I do appreciate at least looking into it. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? No other questions. Thank you. This is not a public hearing for tonight, but we will open it up to questions, or not questions, I'm sorry, uh, public comments. And if you would like to speak, you can please come up and sign, sign in. And um, we will limit your time to three minutes. Please limit your time to three minutes. And we have a clock up here. And when the yellow light comes on, you have one minute left at which time we just ask that you wrap up your comments and the red light indicates that your three minutes are up. Can I take my wife's three minutes? <laughs> well, she's here. I, I, is she here? Yeah. No. no. I, I, everybody individually gets three minutes. All right, okay, just a question. have to stand in line if um, you just whoever whoever is signed up first you can just come up and speak please and then as you as you come up you can just sign in sure. please state your name and um, also if you can please state your address in reference to this project Sure. Uh, Robert Reed, 1355 Trevino. Uh, thank you for giving me time to speak. Where's my light? Because I'm probably going to... Oh, right there. Okay. Um, first off, thank you for letting me speak this evening. Um, I bought my house on Trevino Drive seven years ago. Um, loved it because there were three access points. Uh, I'm sure you already know where they're at now. Um, two off of Square Lake, one off of Rochester Road. Um, Trevino Drive where we're at, there's not a whole lot of traffic and that was one of the reasons that we bought there. Um, the only problem up until this year was a drug house. That drug house is gone, so now this is my new issue, apparently. Um, I read through the OHM memo. Um, I'd actually like to hit on a couple things on that, uh, where it says creation of neighborhoods on one of the uh, bullet points there. Second to the last uh, talks about uh, equivalent contig contiguous residential properties out to those natural barriers. The natural barriers are there right now, the woods, but 180 <coughs> some trees are coming down so that it can dump into Trevino. 
Um, public safety, I can speak of that on two issues. Number one, uh, I am a member of Station 5, which ser uh, the fire station which services this area. We get into Golf Trail fine. We can get into Oak Forest fine right now. Uh, we would come down Atkins to get into Golf Trail or come down through Square Lake. Either way, uh, I don't see an issue with that. Uh, from the police side, I am a police officer, not in Troy, but in another city. I'm a sergeant with the city of Pleasant Ridge. I don't see any, see any issues for public safety where someone would have to get in to wind around. Um, if I'm going lights and siren to get somewhere, I'm not going to cut in off of Rochester Road and go 40 miles an hour lights and sirens through the subdivision to get into Oak Forest. It's just not feasible. I would take Square Lake or shoot over to John R. Um, well, since I have only a minute left, uh, I don't want to see this dumped into our sub. I have two little kids. There's a lot of children in our neighborhood. There's two special needs kids just on my block, and one of them tends to run into the street pretty consistently. Um, while I understand that there's all kinds of algorithms, testing, whatever, to find out how many cars would go into that neighborhood, I find it hard to believe that 25 houses that would be adjacent to my street are only going to dump seven cars in at rush hour. That just doesn't seem feasible to me. I understand it's about making money. I know this gentleman wants to make money, but if you look at OHM's thing, they say they put people first. That's what I'm asking you to do, put people first ahead of money. Um, I, I adamantly oppose this, and uh, I hope that you guys can see where my concern comes from. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Oh, I wasn't next. Oh, it's okay. That's all right. Go ahead. All right. uh, my name is David Burke. I own the home at 1358 Trevino Drive, three houses down or four or five houses down. Uh, every vehicle going through the proposed intersection of Trillium Drive under Trevino Drive and back will pass in front of my property. The property I just purchased this year because of the quiet nature of the street and subdivision and of the family atmosphere. In fact, every year at Halloween, there's a neighborhood parade featuring the Troy Athens marching band, followed by 100 kids in costumes walking down the street. No police are required, and no street needs to be blocked off. That's how quiet it is. This parade weaves through the neighborhood along the same streets that this proposal suggests would make for a good thoroughfare, joining two of the busiest rush hour streets in Troy. In fact, during rush hour traffic going north on Rochester, it is regularly backed up for a mile of stop and go traffic passing the entrance to Golf Trail subdivision at Player Drive. I know this because I'm in it daily. When I turn onto Player Drive, I'm often following and being followed by cars that are already taking the shortcut to Square Lake via Hillmore Drive. I'd like to request that a traffic impact study be done to before any approval is even considered. In the half hour I take to make some notes this evening, exactly one vehicle went by my house. Our part of Trevino is effectively a dead end, which is how we'd like it to stay. By the way, the one vehicle was a UPS truck. With a thorough through fare, how many more trucks would be past our doors? Dozens? How long would it take for Google Maps to figure out this shortcut would shave five to ten minutes off the wait if you cut through the subdivision during rush hour? I don't think it would be unreasonable to suggest that it would be in the hundreds of, tra of vehicles. These are not residents. These are people who will be driving through using Google to tell them to drive through. I do it. I know. I would also like to point out that through Trillium Drive would meet uh, the, the Trillium Drive would meet the 20 foot, 8 foot minimum street width. It would also come on to a 25 foot wide Trevino, which becomes 17 feet. Which, once you factor all of the parked cars, it's always fully parked. 17 feet for two-way traffic to whiz past one another. Already on Player Drive, the sharp corner onto Casper requires neighbors to let on vehicle, to let oncoming vehicles come around the corner to be safe. Uh, we know them, we see each other, we stop because we're neighbors and ensuring there are no children playing in the street. There are always kids on that corner. Another point I'd like to make, which I validated with a local real estate agent, is that the property values in our, of homes in this very quiet subdivision would 100% go down. Finally, last night I had the pleasure of taking my Labrador for a walk, meeting many, of, many, many of our neighbors who fortunately, or perhaps not, were out shoveling snow. These streets included Trevino, Caspers, Player, Beatty, Demerit, Littler, uh, Nicholas, and Boros Drive. I spoke to every person I saw, over 20 people, several I see here tonight, a couple that I invited, and to a person, every single one said no, they do not want this thoroughfare. 
So please, before you approve this proposal, do a traffic study, survey the neighborhood, especially don't assume that anyone in Golf Trail wants this to go through. And I'd be surprised if our new neighbors on the other side of, say, an EVA, which would solve some of your safety issues, would, would want it either once they start living there. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Wickersham, and I live at 1143 Trevino Drive. You're seeing a pattern here. Uh, we are the people most greatly affected, I believe, immediately by allowing this street to go through. I live at the corner of Trevino and Demerit, which will be one of the corners that is most greatly affected by this traffic pattern because people will turn around my house to get up toward Player Drive and out to Rochester Road. We've lived here 10 years. I agree with everyone. It is a very quiet neighborhood. And from time to time, like in every neighborhood, you have people who drive quickly and things like that. Our kids play out in our streets. Our kids feel comfortable in the neighborhood they're in. And I severely disagree with the data that was given about seven people driving in our neighborhood during rush hour. I see how things work, and I agree with the comment that was made. I would like to see more data shown about that, because when I look at the map, I don't see one way for people to come through. They can come down Square Lake, across John R., et cetera. We're in the day and age of let me get there faster, and I don't want my neighborhood and my children to be affected by that. I'm not worried about my property value. I'm worried about the quality of where I live. And the data that's provided, I work in public education. You can make data say whatever you want. The data you're providing for me is saying that you haven't thought very clearly about the residents it'll affect. I was listening tonight to you talking about how pretty it would look. Not once did I hear anybody talk about how it affect the people who live in the neighborhood adjacent. Are we concerned about safety or how pretty a house looks? Thank you. Thank you. My name's uh, Michael McCarty. I live on the uh, east side of this development and I wonder if perhaps we could scroll down to drawing P5. Uh, I live uh, at the end of Hopedale Street, and uh, I'm the last house on the south side of uh, the street, uh, just adjacent to, down in the lower right-hand corner, you see a sewer connection. That uh, manhole cover for that sewer is in my, our front yard, so you can guess what my interests are. Um, the open space, as that's designated there, that piece of property to the right or the far east of the development, uh, the area along the eastern property line is where the sewer connection from this new development uh, will go to uh, connect to the western end of Hopedale, which is down there at the bottom. Uh, this uh, will require a trench, I believe, of about 12 or more feet deep and 300 or more feet long. Big hole. This area currently has a drainage problem. I've lived here more than 33 years and I cannot remember a year when there was not a pond at the end of Hopedale Street with ducks swimming in it. In mid-May, the ponds become mosquito havens. It gets quite uh, uh, unpleasant. This is a problem for the people on Hopedale. It's a people for the peop uh, problem for the people on Abbotsford. And it's going to be a problem for the people who are going to occupy 11, 12, 13, and 14 houses there. Uh, my, uh, my request is that when you backfill the sewer excavation hole that runs from uh, Hopedale up to the corner of uh, Trillium, that uh, you <coughs> carefully grade this so that the drainage and ponding problems 
are eliminated. Okay, that's <coughs> issue one. Second issue, can the sewer line be installed using directional drilling techniques rather than uh, excavating to reduce the impact on tree removal and uh, disruption in the area? Issue three, the Hopedale uh, sewer currently serves about 25 homes. This new connection will more than double the sewer load. Can you offer Hopedale residents assurance that this new connection will not create new problems for us? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Gibbons. I am at 1340 Trevino Drive. So I am in that section uh, between Casper and Willow Grove, the area that is going to be most directly affected by this connection. Um, as I pointed out in letters, there, there are a lot of children in this subdivision. I, I want to echo the concerns of many of the residents that this is going to become a thoroughfare as people look for a way to cut through Rochester to Square Lake or Rochester to John R. There are no fewer than a dozen children simply in that stretch from Casper to Willow Grove under the age of 10. These are children that have grown up in that section as friends going to the local school who have never experienced traffic <laughs> like we potentially are going to experience. There's been the traffic study. I, re I read the traffic study. Uh, it is generalizations. It's not specific to this particular case. Furthermore, the connections in Oak Forest 1 and 2 are blocked from each other. There isn't any, any data, there isn't even any data of folks who would want to cut from John R. to Square Lake let alone folks who'd want to cut from John R. to Rochester. I would like to suggest that the traffic study is insufficient for making this decision. It's a lovely subdivision. The houses are great. I've met some of the neighbors in there. My wife and I have walked through the neighborhood. It's not an issue of not wanting to develop the area or develop the region or meet new people. I would like to see a barrier between the two. An EVA, uh, perhaps the other barrier that was considered the last time this came before the council, uh, connecting it up with Willow Grove. Willow Grove is a gravel road, I'd like to point out. So there's very little traffic up and down Willow Grove. The residents of Trevino don't even use Willow Grove that often because it's a gravel road. So I don't see residents coming out of the new subdivision and heading up Willow Grove to get to Square Lake any easier. They're going to stay on the paved roads that the city has to maintain, the city has to pay for. Why put the extra effort into the traffic pattern that's going to go through our subdivision that's more wear and tear on those roads and that's more time, maintenance, and potentially injured residents? I strongly oppose making a connection between the two. The development looks wonderful. I strongly oppose connecting the two subdivisions together for anything other than bikes or walking. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Troy City Council. I appreciate you taking my comments here. I've been a Troy resident on Trevino Drive for 25 years. I currently live right at the corner of Trevino and Willow Grove. And like the previous gentleman stated, I have no qualms with the development. However, is this a floodplain, if I may inquire? Because I know Trevino Drive slopes down considerably to where I'm at, it's at the low point of any kind of ponding of water or anything. So I don't know how many yards of topsoil you're going to have to bring in to make this a development, but in any event, you're going to possibly offset the water flow. In addition to that, many times as we realize in a quiet subdivision, People today, kids especially, they may not use the sidewalks. 
How many times am I driving down a tree, street? I'm, I'm, you know, kids are in the street driving their bikes. Joggers, they jog in the street. It seems like the sidewalks, we don't even need sidewalks anymore. So literally, Trevino Drive, to extend it to this Oak Forest 4, you're literally creating one long drag strip because many times I've seen people come off of Willow Grove just plowing down Willow Grove, pull on the Trevino, and next thing you know, they're just racing down Trevino. So the thing is, is you have to take in consideration just the geometric formation of the length of Trevino and then extending it even more, it just doesn't make sense because, and in addition to the, of course, Troy is a very affluent area. I live, I grew up in Macomb County, okay? A house in Macomb County with the same exact house in Oakland County is $75,000 difference. You come to Troy for the schools, the quality of life, you don't compare apples to apples with size, square footage, and what you can get for the house. It's the quality of life that brings us to Troy, okay? And the, uh, and that's why I'm strongly opposed to the connectivity. Why don't you make this a cul-de-sac? Uh, if one, two, and three, four oak are connected, why would they want to go, they, they, they use Torino or payroll. Why can't you have an exit on the Willow Grove? Just like he said, who wants to drive on a, a gravel road? <sighs> I guess to say is the enhancements were already there for us to enjoy. Now the builder and the design to empty out on Trevino is just a, a convenience for their own exit. I don't see any enhancement for the current residents, especially a long time <clears throat> resident like myself that's gotten used to nice peace and tranquility here. And I would appreciate a, a much more uh, strategic implementation of how to go about this rather than try to railroad this through. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't. What is his name? I don't think he told us his name. Oh, thank you. Oh, I thought it was. Yeah, yeah I ain't gonna get My name is Cheryl Herzog, and I live in Golf Trail Subdivision on 5431 Boros Drive. I do not uh, see uh, any traffic coming through my street. However, I am the current Golf Trail Board President, and it's a, a lovely subdivision of 196 homes. Um, as it, it was stated earlier, um, in the past, a diagonal barricade was approved in the past. I want that to be considered. I like the gentleman's idea about a cul-de-sac terminating there at Willow Grove um, to try and keep traffic out of our subdivision. Um, one of the reasons I can see people using our as a thoroughfare is because Square Lake is a two-lane road with no left turn lane. Um, obviously they're going to try and avoid traffic which backs up again at Rochester Road at the uh, player drive light quite regularly, almost a mile all from Square Lake down to Long Lake. Um, like I say, we have much more tools that allow people to cut through. Again, very concerned for the children of the neighborhood. Uh, would like to see um, a discussion held maybe with our residents. Um, as Don has suggested, we haven't been contacted for any of our concerns. Um, let's see here. Um, we also have a private five acre park which is directly behind the homes on Trevino. So people will cross Trevino from one side to the other to get to the park. Again, more cars going down the street is a, is a potential hazard. And, and again, our, our children are our most precious thing. Again, we're not against developing. Um, our only regret looking back, of course, is green space. JC Park being right there. There was a potential that, you know, even the city could have expanded JC Park by buying that parcel. But that's all hindsight, it's 2020. I understand that. Um, again, uh, the development is not necessarily building the types of homes that Troy needs with the growing baby boomers. I happen to have a ranch, I'm all set. <laughs> but I guess I was looking ahead. 
Um, I, I, I see all the uh, news reports of people wanting to stay in Troy, but again, they're not being offered the housing options that they desire. Uh, Golf Trail has enjoyed almost 40 years of not having access to John R. Um, we're fine with that. I can't imagine that the adjoining subdivisions, which I believe one, two, three, and four would all connect, if I'm not mistaken. Um, again, the traffic study I seen is insufficient. Um, they would also have 196 homes times two cars per home, potentially going toward John R. Uh, I appreciate your time and attention and uh, letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Hensley, 1424 Trevino Drive. I apologize if any of this is redundant, as I think most of us have the same identical concerns. Um, overall, I don't think anybody here from Golf Trail is opposed to the subdivision, per se. I think they're opposed to what is going to create a drag strip effect going down the two roads. Uh, as the Wickersham spoke, there at the corner of Demerit, from Demerit to Willow Grove, there is not a single stop sign in the subdivision. As well as from Player to the corner of Casper and Demerit, there is only a yield sign at that point. So what's going to happen, from what I've seen living there for nearly seven years, is that the people that are doing the shortcut, sitting in traffic on Rochester, and turning onto Player Drive, and then turning left onto Hillmore, will now continue on down through Trevino to get through up to Ashford or out to Oak Forest. The other issue I have is that I believe, uh, after reading the traffic study, I feel like it's incredibly flawed. Uh, it seems like it's quite a boilerplate uh, driven memo, which implies that the significance of the problems are far less than what they will be. Uh, one of those issues are most people will go from the subdivision and it doesn't really take into account Oak Forest 1, 2, or 3. It takes into account 4. And all of them will be interconnected to get to Trillium Drive. And I think the majority of those cars will go through uh, Trevino up to Rochester Road because Rochester Road is the main thoroughfare to get to the main artery in this state, I-75 north-south and 59 east-west. It's not as convenient to go up John R to either south or north to get to I-75 or M-59. <clears throat> Another thing that uh, is spoken in the in the statement is that uh, it will relieve traffic on the artery roads. We don't want to relieve traffic on the artery roads because what that is actually saying is he's 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 proving his own point by saying that the arteries will not suffer as much as the subdivision roads will. Meaning there's going to be more traffic on the roads in our subdivision. Mostly what we're looking for is an EVA that breaks the connectivity between the two subdivisions. We can have uh, foot traffic, bike traffic between the two. I don't think that there's a problem with that. But when you create that long, nearly probably over a quarter mile distance between one to the other, I believe it's going to have grave effects for the safety of our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, good evening. My name's Robert Ziski. I live at 1369 Trevino Drive. Uh, I've been a homeowner there for 12 years now. And like you know, many of you, when you've purchased your house in Troy, you bought it for the subdivision and what that subdivision had to offer you, where your house sat. And I purchased mine for you know the reasons of you know the quietness of the neighborhood, the fact that it pretty much is a dead end, be, being that Willow Grove is a gravel lot. There's not a lot of traffic that comes through there and I understand the the, uh, the building um, I'm not opposed to the new subdivision but I am strongly opposed to the connectivity of the subdivisions uh, I think like most people pointed out tonight I think you've seen that there is a lot of flaws in the study uh, it does seem to be a rubber stamped memo that was put together very hastily to prove somebody's point uh, so I would uh, strongly encourage you to take another look at that. Think about the safety of our children. Um, and I think from what you heard earlier from uh, Mr. Reed, from an uh, emergency standpoint, there's no issue. They're not going to, they, they don't need to have access through those points, so we don't need it to worry about that. And um, I think pretty much everything's been said that needs to be said from our neighbors tonight. So please. Um, take this into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Kevin Wickersham. Uh, my lovely wife spoke earlier. <laughs> uh, I live at 1143 Trevino Drive. Uh, I do think it's going to be severely impacted there if the car is coming straight through and then turning right. A lot of times my kids will set up their hockey nets out there, they'll play tennis in the street. Um, so that's a concern of mine. Uh, you know, the whole development thing, I get that, I get that. Things need to be developed. I'm sure when our subdivision first came in, people were like, oh my God, you know, another sub, what do we need another sub for? So I, I, I get that. Um, you know, I don't see as many deer anymore when I come down Willow Grove, so that's unfortunate. But <laughs> uh, my other concern is, you know, and I don't want to beat a dead horse here. I, I think everyone has spoken very well um, and voiced their concerns. Uh, my question was when they when they did this study, this OHM, did they sit at the light uh, at Player Drive and Rochester Road at seven in the morning? <laughs> that would be my concern. Um, I sit at that light, and I swear it feels like an eternity. And I'm like maybe two, three cars back max. That light changes green. Bam. One car goes, maybe two. <laughs> I miss my window. I'm sitting here for another five minutes. <laughs> and then they were saying, you know, this is going to add maybe seven more cars or something or whatever, the, the study. Um, it, it, that light alone would have to be looked at. I mean, it changes like that, and then it stays red for what seems like an eternity. <laughs> you add seven more cars to my work, I'm going to have to start waking up an hour earlier or finding another exit out of my subdivision to go to work every day. Um, so that's just it. I wanted to mention the light. Like I said, a lot of good things were brought up. Um, question the study. And like I said, data is an easy thing to finagle. You know, you can get numbers to say anything you want them to if you know what you're doing. Thanks. Thank you. No, sir. Um, you had a chance to speak. We will have an, another option for public comment at the end of the meeting if you stick around. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Yes, Mr. Edmonds. I'd like to ask the Planning Commission if they would allow him to speak another 30 seconds. Um, I vote no. If anybody can, you, can you just elaborate on that, Mr. Edmonds? For, well, what's the purpose? I mean, He's my neighbor. OK. Sorry. Maybe I'm just a little biased, but I think he has a right to speak. We allow the applicant 15 minutes, but we only allow the residents three minutes. I, 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 I think understand that's our policy, but I think we, in all 
respect, we could allow this guy another 30 seconds. I think we'll give, we can give him another chance to speak at the, at the end. We have another option for public comment, and we'll, we'll, we can give you another chance to speak at the end of the meeting. We can do that. Is that it's fine? It's fine. It's fine. Okay. No more comments uh, from the audience, and we'll bring it back to the table. Any, any comments, um, questions, I guess, um, further, further discussion? Ms. Cruz. Uh, Mr. Savadon, I hate to put you on the spot, but maybe you could enlighten us as to um, OHM and, and why the city uses consultants like OHM for traffic studies and the type of people who are credentialed and work at places like OHM and, and how that helps us come to um, decisions. We utilize the services of OHM. They're an impartial third party expert in traffic. So um, when we received this application, we circulated it interdepartmentally and um, we, we circulated so it gets uh, input from the engineer, this traffic engineer, building official, et cetera, et cetera. When we circulated it, um, there was no, the. Uh, we were not requested to seek a full bore traffic study, as someone indicated that this this was this was too vague of a study. Um, there was no indication at the time that we even needed a traffic study. Um, based on, we started to get a lot of in, emails and input from neighbors concerned about traffic. So I contacted OHM again, a neutral third party expert, asked them to prepare a, a summary of of this application, and that is what w was provided to us. They are, I am not an engineer, I'm not a traffic, certainly not an expert in traffic, OHM is, and that was a report that we received to uh, address my concerns, my request. So when planning commissioners are given a report uh, by a firm like OHM, we are then to expect that it's been prepared by people who are credentialed, educated, knowledgeable, and considered experts in the field of what they do? We utilize OHM not, not only for traffic issues like this, but also parking. And you've heard me and Mr. Carlisle at numerous meetings indicate that that we defer to our experts, yes. not only in traffic, but also parking. And, and for this issue tonight, as we have in other issues related to parking and traffic, I would defer to our expert, which is OHM. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tegel. Um, Brent, this is no way a traffic study. This is a report, and in the report, they identified goals uh, for uh, good planning practices, goals that the city of Troy wants to achieve. Uh, but there was no study done. They, they quoted uh, from uh, good sources what traffic trips would be expected from an occupancy that's being planned here. So for everyone that came up to speak, and referring to this as a traffic study, it was incorrect. This is not a study. There's been no study done as to how many trips actually, how many cars go down these streets a day. Um, as I've listened to the residents, uh, I've heard primarily, as we all have, concerns for safety of children. Um, I think there could be some, some uh, steps taken for this to be a win-win. But some of those steps certainly are born upon the parents of the children that are playing in a street that's meant for cars. Whether it's a street that's not heavily traveled or not, there's a responsibility that those children have to understand that it's not their playground. It's a street for cars. So in that respect, I think the, the residents of the existing subdivisions that allow their children to play in the streets maybe need to reconsider that. But on the other hand, if there are traffic calming devices that can be employed, whether it's in the new proposed subdivision or on the existing street or additional stop signs, I can't, I, I don't know the name of the street that connects uh, Square Lake and John R. just in the, at the northwest corner. It's an angular street behind Kensington Church. But there are stop signs, probably four or so stop signs along that street and there aren't necessarily cross streets, they're just traffic calming devices. So I think there could be some opportunities here um, 
for uh, this development to proceed. And, and the residents' concerns about this being a, a throughway or a drag strip um, uh, could be allevi alleviated. Um, and unfortunately, one of, the, one of the gentlemen that came up actually admitted that he cuts through subdivisions because Google tells him it's a quicker way to go. Um, so I think that, you know, again, we're all, we're all human beings and we want to get to point A to point B as quickly as we can, but we also want to concern, be concerned with the safety of those that are, are along the journey. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Savadon. So this is my second consecutive late night, so my brain is, is probably not on the same pace as my tongue tonight. So I want to clarify what I said. When this application was submitted, a, de the, a detailed traffic study was not warranted. However, based on concerns of the neighbors, I contacted OHM, and they provided a more cursory traffic report. Right. You are absolutely correct. Yeah, I, I, please, I, I wasn't... I wasn't pointing the finger at you, but I was trying to tell the residents, this is not a traffic study. So don't come up here and say the traffic study was flawed. Excuse me. So, so the point was that this is a report, basically. Yes. Ms. Cooper. <clears throat> One of the residents raised the issue of player and the traffic light. Is that something someone can look into? Um, just... I know that that's a, uh, that's a concern now. Uh, I know we've had other situations where people have come up. If there are existing concerns, regardless of the subdivision, we should be... I, I can certainly have the traffic engineer look at the timing of the light. No problem. Thank you. Ms. Hell. In my opinion, residents have raised legitimate concerns into connecting the subdivisions that make the current proposals at least somewhat questionable. Therefore, especially because no meeting was conducted between the residents and the developers, I think it would be productive to hear from the developers if they've considered alternative options, such as an EVA or a diagonal barrier, and respond to the comments, balancing their concerns with the concerns of the neighbors, why they feel connection is the best choice. Mr. Savadon, I'm going to ask a hypothetical question here. I'm not sure that can be answered tonight, but... Suppose that Oak Forest 1, 2, and 3, and 4 were all being submitted at the same time. Would that warrant a more in-depth traffic study as opposed to just um, Oak Forest number 4 that's coming before us tonight with only 25 homes? Or would that be equally um, small in trip generation that we would get something similar from OHM? As I indicated earlier, I'm not an expert, I'm not an engineer nor a traffic, nor a traffic expert. Um, they would review, the, they would review the, the entirety, which I, I'm doing my math here, it's about 75, 110, 110 lots with, with uh, numerous connections to John R. So it's case by case basis. Um, they would weigh all that and make a determination whether a, tra a full board traffic study would be required. I don't know. I can't speak for, for Bill Hootery. Do you recall um, one of the latest developments that we've had in the city that might have been similar to, in scale to the, this development in totality, one, two, three, and four, where maybe we had 50, 60, 70 homes that was submitted before us that actually did not, did not have an actual full-blown traffic study? I mean, just off the top of your head, I mean, have we had anything that... Rain tree cluster development, I believe, was about 60 homes. Um, did, did not have a traffic study. Okay. Mr. Carla. Yeah, I mean, in, in, did not have a traffic study, and that was also accessing through one point of access through an existing subdivision. Okay. So that, right, I, I recall that that was only one point of access, and compared to this, this actually would have three if that would open up to to the west okay mr sanzik i'm just curious mr seven at what point would um you look in the, the existing subdivision for uh, stop signs and other traffic controls uh in if this were to be developed as it's proposed would, would there be an opportunity for that to happen 
I believe, again, I can't speak for the engineering department, but I believe when there's, when there's requests by neighborhoods with, with concerns about speeding or excessive traffic or um, other issues, safety issues, that the engineering department, uh, in cooperation with the police department, is more than happy to meet with, with the, uh, the residents, study the problem, and come up with solutions. That's, again, case-by-case -case basis. And following up on that, those requests are held by our uh, considered by the traffic committee, which is not in the purview of the planning commission, correct? That is correct. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Crent. I, uh, I was looking at my own map very carefully of how the traffic, I've been a resident for 39 years here, and I know the roads pretty well. I've traveled them quite often. Point is, um, I can, the one gentleman that came up earlier and talked about people in the new subdivision, the Oak Forest uh, 4, wanting access to I-75, I could see that they would want to go through the existing subdivision down um, Trevino and then up to Player. So that, right by your house, by the way. Um, so I could see that as a, as a potential problem. Uh, I'm not concerned, I looked at the path, some people were talking about the, the path people may take to get from Rochester Road to John R. and it's a very circuitous path. I don't think uh, the average driver would want to take, go through all that subdivision, swing around, back, back around, you know, making all kind of S turns, getting through all the way to John R. Um, that is not my concern. My concern would be people in the new subdivisions, in the Oak Forest three and four, getting to Rochester Road. And again, the other one other gentleman mentioned that maybe two or three cars can get through on that light at one time turning left. So then, then again, you add those extra cars from three and four, and possibly even from two, coming into that situation and backing up on a player. So um, I'm not in favor of just opening it wide open. I, I think there should be, um, I don't, I'm not sure if I want an emergency vehicle access kind of thing, but maybe something designed in the road. I noticed at the where Oak Forest Drive goes out to John R., there's a, there's a couple right angle bends you've got to go through to make it more difficult. Um, there may be, I, there may be a, a good solution right at that point where Trevino would um, engage into the new road on this new subdivision, but it shouldn't be a straight shot through. There's got to be some kind of a uh, calming or, or bending of the roads or making it very not obvious to cut through. Uh, maybe an island put there and a, a, a route around it. So I'm not thrilled about a straight cut through. Neither am I really. I would like to have an ability of some cars to get through as opposed to just an EVA, just completely block it off. So um, I would like to see the developer come up with some more creative ideas. I think the, the cul-de-sac would not be my, my first, uh, you know, cul-de-sac the new, the new street off and just ba basically end it so they couldn't have access to Willow Grove. Willow Grove, as we all know, is, is dirt. And very rarely will people from really nice big homes want to take their high-end vehicle down a dirt road. So that's, that's my concern. So all in all, one question I would probably ask in, in, if we go with the traffic study, which I'd like to see done, um, is to see the cut-through traffic that does, uh, where people are going northbound on Rochester Road, will they cut through player, or not player, but um, yeah. Yeah, it would be player, up to uh, Hillmore to get onto Square, Square Lake uh, Road. So I'd, I'd like to see a, a more of a, not just a little study on just the neighborhood streets, but I'd like to see a big a study that in, includes Rochester Road, Square Lake. I don't think John R is in the picture, truthfully. It's such a, it's so far off uh, as far as getting to it from Rochester Road through all the subdivisions if it went through. So that's what I'd like to see done. I, I don't, I don't. I think this needs more study. I don't think we should just say, "Yeah, let's just let's just uh, allow this subdivision with that planned road go ahead right now." I think there should be some kind of traffic. I don't want to, not just calling, but discouragement from connecting the two. And I, I don't have a solution immediately. But someone mentioned diagonal roads. I don't know what that is. A diagonal uh, interface between the two, uh, but something to happen at that point where it's 
not evident that you can just go through. I, I just, I just have a thought to that. I think uh, if something is being proposed in terms of geometrics or design in a, in a public road owned by the city, I think the engineering department won't have to have to sign off on that because obviously that would be a, um, a design issue that the city has to sign off. It, it could pose a liability issue. It's a maintenance issue if we put an island. The, the first one location that comes to mind that I can think of that actually is like that is Satchin Way uh, when we were dealing with, the, with that neighborhood. And that actually has that type of geometric. So I, I don't know, you know how in the past uh, few years since that neighborhood has been constructed, how the city has dealt with maintaining that road and, you know, the, just, just the actual efficiency of driving that and, and it, if, if it actually does even calm anything. So, you know, that might be worth looking into if we would look into some, doing something like this here. I'd yes, like Mr. To follow up on that. I take Satchin Road, when, when yeah. traffic for Somerset collection gets mobbed and I, my, I live on Alpine, so I when I can't get out of Alpine because of the backup, it's usually two lanes of the three on Big Beaver. I, it's almost impossible. People don't even want you to get in. I sometimes go through Satchin Way and go around that island. It is calming. You cannot go through that. Truthfully, it's 15 miles an hour, maybe 20 max. You can't go 25 miles an hour around that island. You really can't. I mean, you could, but you'd be, you know, maybe screeching some tires but the point I'm getting at is that's a good that's a good solution it works on Satchin Way just to let you know I've done it many times when Alpine had to, cannot I can't get out of my street Mr. Salvador Chairman Appahitting you're 100 percent correct any type of traffic calming traffic diverting device would need to be vetted with input from the city engineer the Department of Public Works etc also um, this is you, the, just a reminder: the Planning Commission speaks in resolutions. I've heard, I've heard one member suggest that this is the direction he'd like to go, but this is not. There's not been a vote yet, so. Sure. One of the comments I've heard, I, I guess, see from Mr. Crent and uh, some of the audience that spoke, is requesting additional, uh, an additional traffic study that's in more in depth. Um, I, I'm all in favor for for more data and more. Um, more uh, and more depth study if it actually leads to a different conclusion and my thought on this is that the the data that we have before us tonight just for the, this development for the 25 homes is based on industry standard the IT trip generation manual and the same study that is being requested would be based on the same manual for trip, trip generation and uh, the numbers that we have before us we, I mean, first of all, we have to actually take them at face value that somebody that is a professional in their field has um, used this manual and the generation that comes out of this is actual trip generation for that location. So we would just transpose that to another study would result in similar numbers just um, at a different scale. And my thought on that is somebody that wants a more in-depth study would ha first be willing to accept this data because something similar would come out, come out of another another study. So that's just my thought, Mr. Tegel. Um, I agree uh, for different reasons that I don't know that a study is the next step. Um, I, I think a study is going to take into account actual conditions, less curt, less obviously the uh, the new subdivision, but what, what are the traffic patterns and the n number of cars that are currently on those streets. Um, but I really would like to see before before I'm ready to vote on this uh, to see if uh, a meeting could be had with the city engineer, the police department, the developer, and a representative of a neighbor of the neighborhood subdivision to say, here, here are our problems. What can we do to solve these problems, uh, and then come back in front of us and see if there's uh, if there's some common ground? Because right now, I, you know, again, I, I hear the concerns. Uh, I think some of the concerns. Uh, should be borne by the, the existing residents. Uh, but on the other hand, if there are opportunities uh, to prevent, uh, you know, through, through traffic or slow traffic down, uh, I think those should be considered as well. Mr. Craig. I just want to agree. I agree with John Table on that. I think a uh, traffic study may not be the, the answer. 
it could be a, a joint meeting of <clears throat> residents, city staff, to figure out a way to, to not have this uh, quick, easy path through the two uh, subdivisions. Mr. Salvador, what would be the next step if uh, we haven't voted on the resolution yet, but uh, what would be the next step of approaching staff or um, engineering to actually put something together and further explore any, any other options? Well, if, if, um, if I'm reading you the, the board correctly, there seems to be consensus on, on this meeting that was just discussed. So um, with, with that assumption in mind, um, the correct step would be to postpone this item to provide an opportunity to hold this meeting, to conduct this meeting, see if there's uh, alternative solutions, and then come back at a future meeting, and likely in January, if I'm reading the board correctly. Any other thoughts from any other members on, on postponing this item or moving forward with the resolution tonight? And, and, if, and if, we, if we did, if that was the... the uh, the, the direction that we went and I would invite um, the traffic engineer, the applicant, the neighborhood association representative or representatives, Department of Public Works, our traffic consultant, our planning consultant, and some uh, other members of city management to have a, to make sure it's fully vetted. Yeah. I concur with that. Okay. Ms. Cruz. So if I'm understanding correctly what it is I'm hearing, I heard you say that we could do an in-depth traffic study, but the basis and the foundation for the report that we have in front of us would also be the same basis and foundation that would be included in a more detailed uh, traffic study. Was that correct? That's correct, bro. Yes. I mean, to, do, if, to get a more definite answer, that would be coming from, our, so, from a traffic engineer. Right, because you engineer. said no point in doing a new study if you can't at least accept the data foundation that was in the report that we have. Correct. Okay. So then if we gather the people that you've described for a meeting to discuss alternatives, then I would say the possibility exists that there really aren't alternatives to the number of people that are going to live in the neighborhood, right? I mean, because mm -hmm. we're going to have 25 houses in this, and there's going to be 25 houses. Um, so I'm just thinking, what could the variables possibly be that would ultimately result in something different? So all I'm suggesting is we could go through this exercise and come back to Planning Commission and determine that we're exactly where we were before. That's possible. That's possible. There, I also heard some comments raised by uh, Mr. Krent and Mr. Tagle that perhaps there are traffic calming, traffic diverting right. opportunities either at the intersection or within one of the, either any of the, the subdivisions or site condominiums that perhaps could alleviate some of these, uh, some of these concerns <laughs> if, they're, if they're actually, you know, based on the input of the experts, they're, they're determined to be valid. Or, right. or feasible. They'd, they'd have to be feasible. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I, I just, I also heard from a number of residents they're not opposed to the development. Right. The issues are are the traffic. Right. And so what my my desire would be for the people that have the concerns, the people that are doing the development, and those in the city that should have input on this to see if there are some things that can be done to solve that problem. Agreed. Because the issue here isn't, is the development legal or not? Can they do what they're doing or want to do? The question is, can we solve the concerns of the residents in a reasonable fashion? Mr. Sanzica. Chairman, I, I do agree that we should go ahead and that propose that the city staff with our traffic consultant please review the uh, proposed development and if there's any common uh, ways to uh, affect the traffic in the subdivision. And also, I, I don't believe this will impact the developer. You know, considering at the time that it's it's uh, December, if we can have an opportunity to review it again in January, or early February, he will still have enough time to get his construction plans prepared in order to uh, start his construction in the spring. So if I may, I'd like to propose 
uh, resolution uh, resolve that preliminary site condominium approval pursuant to Article 8 and Section 10.02 of the zoning ordinance as requested for Oak Forest Number 4 site condominium 25 units per lot, uh, 25 unit lots south of Square Lake Road, west of John R, east side of Willow Grove, Section 11, currently zoned R1C, one family residential district B, B um, granted or postponed, postponed uh, for the reasons so stated to allow the uh, city staff to meet with the uh, police department, with their traffic consultant, with, with the uh, representative from the subdivision and the developer to uh, look at traffic calming uh, devices or uh, opportunities uh, to lessen the impact of the traffic on, on the uh, existing subdivisions. Moved by Mr. Sanzika, supported by Mr. Edmonds. Roll call, Ms. Arnicky, please. Mr. Crit? Yes. Ms. Koopa? Yes. Mr. Sanzika? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Apahidian? Yes. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Item is postponed for until at the earliest in January, right, Mr. Savanat? Yes. Okay. The, early, the earliest it's the, that we would meet would be the second Tuesday in January. There is no meeting this fourth, uh, fourth Tuesday of December. Okay. Yes, Mr. Edmonds. Yes. So I just had one other comment. I know we who live in Gulf Trail and exit quite often at Player Drive and Rochester Road, that traffic light has become come to be known as the forever light. And but I think you need to everyone needs to understand that traffic light is controlled by Oakland County, if I'm correct. Yep. So it's not within our purview. Yes, we can lobby and we can advocate, as you've all done very respectfully tonight. I, I thank you for all your comments. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to commend the audience again for their being so articulate and allowing uh, us to uh, review this in a, in a timely manner. And uh, you, you expressed your opinions very astutely and artic articulated them very well. And, Again, I'd like to co uh, commend the audience for their, uh, their professional way that they uh, submitted their concerns. Thank you. Moving on to item number six on the agenda. We're back to public comment. If there's anyone in the audience that wishes to speak on an item on the current agenda, we will give you another chance. Uh, please come forward. And if you have signed in, just please state your name again for the record. Thank you. Uh, it's David Burke, and one of the things that I wanted to point out, and I didn't have a chance because this study was new to us tonight, so we did not have a chance to see it, um, but they kind of answer the question that I think many of us brought up. There's a point on the people are going to use our street as a cut-through point where they state uh, modern residential subdivision street design employs a combination of horizontal curvature, street indication, traffic calming measures to discourage high speed and non-subdivision non related traffic. Unless the adjacent arterial road system is grossly deficient, which I would like want brought to the traffic consultant's attention because Rochester is grossly deficient going north at rush hour. And that's what we're saying we'll cut through. So that's the one point I wanted to, to bring up. And since I have the floor in a couple seconds, the other part was, if we're wrong, what's the remediation? How wrong do you have to be to six cars to reverse a decision and put in a barrier after the fact? That'd be another question. No one has to answer it, but that'd be another question that I'd like to see answered. Thank you. Sir, would you like to speak again? Yeah, my name is Phil Tober. My one last concern is may not even address the traffic issue, but this new Oak um, Forest 1, 2, and 3, 4, do they just, maybe this is not to the particular concern, but do they have their own green space for recreational facilities for their own families and everything? Because I do know that, as well Mr. Edwin knows, that Gulf Trail has the largest private park in the, in the whole city of Troy. And we spent thousands of dollars to keep that park 
up to par. And I'm just saying, there are instances where you have residents from other communities that come to our park and either do whatever they do, but at our expense. So is there, you know, this is another overflow from this development. I mean, so what we have, we built up through many, many years of uh, collaborations in our own community. And I would just like to know, is this new development, is, is Fort Worth with their potential residents as we are with ours in our neighborhood? That's it. Thank you. If there's no one else that wishes to speak, then we will move to item number seven on the agenda tonight. Yes. Oh, go ahead, sir. Michael Hensley. Um, you had mentioned uh, when you were discussing it amongst yourselves the issue of the traffic report. And I understand it wasn't a study. I think it was thrown together, but what uh, a few of you have said was that if that report, if the data in that report is in in a microcosm, then the then the macro must support that same data. What we believe is that the data is flawed based on lack of understanding of what the traffic flow in the neighborhood is currently and what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think someone that is doing a traffic study from Plymouth, Michigan, is not seeing what we're seeing living in the neighborhood. So therefore, I believe that a actual study would show different data. But then I also have a question on how do you do a, a traffic study on something that doesn't quite yet exist? Because they cannot do a study on traffic that cannot actually happen yet. So what we're saying is, is that we're going to build the subdivision, have a thoroughfare, do a study, and then after the fact, create an EVA or an angled blockage so there is no interconnectivity. I, I, was, I didn't have an understanding of what you, you were discussing in that area. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to item number seven, planning commission comments. We will start with Ms. Arnicky on that corner. No, thank you. Ms. Howe. Mr. Edmonds. Yes, I'd just like to uh, publicly acknowledge uh, Ms. Cruz's uh, comments at the uh, study session on the uh, city council study session on the open space. And uh, I thought you did an outstanding job. And I thank you very much. Oh, thank you. That's all. Mr. Quinn. I'm also, thanks. Ms. Cooper. Um, I've been preparing for my capstone presentation, so if anybody has time over the holiday break when you're busy with your families, um, also take time to read about the Headley Amendment and what that means, and it's spelled H-E-A-D-L-E-E. -E. So I find it very fascinating. Sorry, <laughs> I just had to share. Thank you. Mr. Tegel. Nothing. I have nothing. Ms. Cruz. Um, just to elaborate a little bit on, on the comment that Mr. Edmonds had made, is I did go last week to the uh, city council meeting that they were having on the Civic Center. And um, one of the things that I have suspected for a long time, but um, was underscored at this meeting by members of city council, is that you know the residents that live in this city are having a hard time understanding um, what laws that we're using when we look at these site plan applications and make a decision. Um, I, we've, we recognize that not all of the citizens, or at least not most of the citizens, understand that we don't always have much in the way of discretion when it comes to making a decision. The other thing that, that I've suspected for a long time and, and also came to light at that meeting was residents are having a hard time understanding that why we have all of this green space and now everything just seems to be getting developed and it seems like the city is very quickly becoming overdeveloped. And 
you know, think that when they have driven past the same parcel of green space for 25 years, well, it must be city owned, right? That must be city land and that it's the city that is selling off this land and allowing all of this development when in fact it's, it's private landowners and the city is um, not the person or not the entity that's, that's on the deed. And so people struggle with the idea that it's been green for so long and we like the wildlife and now you're just going to let, let a developer put houses on it. So um, I think that the takeaway from that is we're really going to have to focus not only as city council but um, planning commission members on educating and getting the message out and helping people understand why it is we do what we do and that even though our decisions may seem contrary we really have gone through an exercise that has their best interests at heart and our overall best interest and vision for the city at heart so thank you for letting me climb on my soapbox <laughs> mr sanzica no comment Mr. Nothing, Frank. thank you. Mr. Stovina. Uh, one of the residents spoke and asked a question about the private park. Um, I'll answer his question. The maintenance and enforcement related to that park is the responsibility of the, of the subdivision. So uh, um, that's, a, that's a private matter that, that your homeowners association would, will have to, have to deal with moving forward. Mr. Carla. Um, piggyback, the second question was, are there other parks associated with one, two, three, and four? There are no private parks in those developments. There is some common open space that's maintained by the homeowner association, but there's no dedicated private parks within those, within those four sections of that, of those developments. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I just had uh, one comment for the commissioners. Those of you that did not have a chance to watch the special study session from last night for city council it was an interesting uh, meeting on uh, opting in or opting out for the city on the medical marijuana um, commercial operations in the city mm -hmm. and uh, there was a lot of interesting information that came out in that session last night so for those of you that are interested that is something that is going to come up again uh, sometime sometime in january uh, I believe another special study session will be set up in January. Um, and for those of you that are interested in that, I encourage you to attend or get more information or watch last night's meeting. Mr. Chairman? Yes. We have a, just a reminder to the audience and those watching on TV and the Planning Commission, we have a YouTube channel. And you can, if anyone wants to learn about medical marijuana, they can watch last night's meeting on our YouTube channel. Um, we are so 21st century. Yes, we are. <laughs> there are actually two um, conversations, one at the Troy Public Library and one um, on January 24th. I don't I think the other one is January 13th, but there's two sessions in January about the Civic Center, um, one at the library and one at the Civic Center. So people should check the Troy City website and attend one of them. I think it would be very helpful to piggyback on what Karen said. It's so important, that's why I'm reading up about the Headley Amendment. So exciting. Okay. If we have no other comments, then uh, we are adjourned for tonight. Thank you, everybody, for coming.